Welcome, welcome to the Daily Power Parsha. Today is December 16th, 2020. It's a Wednesday, and so we are going to explore the fourth reading of the Torah portion of Miketz, Let's Rock and Roll Together. Genesis chapter 41. Oh, this is great. I mean, not great if you were living then and didn't have food, but great for the continuation of the story. As we left it yesterday, just a recap. I always try to get us uh, get us with a running start. Joseph had been appointed viceroy. He had been specifically tasked with the Egyptian food task force, making sure that the food in the years of plenty were being stored in a responsible way for the years of famine, and thus he did. He got married, had two children, Manasseh and Ephraim. That takes us straight to, to the reading number four. Genesis 41, verse 53. And the seven years of plenty that were in the land of Egypt were finished. In other words, fast forward seven years. <laughs> Joseph stood up to Pharaoh, stood in front of Pharaoh, declaring what was going to happen. Well, part one in the books. Part two begins, 54. And the seven years of famine began, as Joseph had said. And there was, a, and there was famine in all the lands. Sorry, but there was famine, in, and there was famine in all the lands, but throughout the land of Egypt, there was bread. That's the emphasis. In other words, in all of the other lands in the region, there was a famine, a severe famine. But in Egypt, they had food. Why did they have food? You guessed it, because of Joseph. I, th I believe they call the area around Egypt the Fertile Crescent. I think that's what they call it, the Fertile Crescent. Nonetheless, at that time, it was not so fertile. There was a famine. But in Egypt, they had what to eat. Let's continue. Let's continue. When the entire land of Egypt hungered, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. But Pharaoh said to, the, to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he tells you, do. So again, it's not that Egypt didn't have the same type of drought or whatever it was that affected the crops. They had the same exact issue that other countries had. But their, the difference is they had stored the food in reserves for this time. So when the people were hungry and they cried out they didn't have food because the, the, you know, the, the stores didn't have food because the farmers didn't have food, Pharaoh said to them, go to Joseph. He's got it. He'll tell you what to do. Now, let's continue verse 56. Now, the famine spread over all the face of the land, which means the entire region. And Joseph opened all the storehouses in which there was grain, and he sold it to the Egyptians. Look at that. What a businessman. Ah, oh, what a Yiddish cup. Look at this guy. He takes the food, taxes the food. Sounds like government. I'm just saying, taxes the food, right? And then when the people need the food, that they, I guess, produced, right? You would believe that farmers produced it. He then sold it back to them, sold it to the Egyptians. And the famine intensified in the land of Egypt. In other words, it kept them going and going and going, but there was this food, there were options, etc. Okay, um, let's continue. And all the inhabitants of the land came to Egypt to Joseph to purchase. Look at that, look at that. All, let me explain what, what, what it's saying here. All the inhabitants of the land, I mean, that, that doesn't only mean Egypt. It means of the surrounding areas, the surrounding countries. They all came to Egypt, to Joseph, to purchase food. For the famine had intensified in the entire land. Let's talk about Rashi. Let's see if Rashi adds up. Oh, look at this insight. When the entire land of Egypt hungered, Rashi says, why did it hunger? For their grain, which they had stored, had decayed, except that of Joseph. People also stored their food. I guess the word leaked out that there was going to be a famine, this prophetic vision, or, or I guess they figured the government was, store, was, was storing uh, grain. Maybe it's for a reason. The people also try to store their own. But honestly, the storehouses, the store storage containers they bought off of Amazon were not ready to cut it for real grain preservation. It's only the good stuff, the industrial stuff that worked, or maybe it was a miracle, who knows? Um, look at this one. 
Look at this one. So interesting. Pharaoh says to the people, whatever he tells you, do. Look at Rashi. Since Joseph had ordered them to circumcise themselves, look at that. Little plot twist. Joseph had told the people, you want food? You got to do a bris. By the way, why did he do this? In anticipation of his own family moving. And he didn't want his family, when they moved to Egypt, to be the only ones that had a bris. So he said, you know what? If we're circumcised, y'all are going to be circumcised. So he told them to, to, to have a bris. And when they came to Pharaoh and said, this is what he said to us, Pharaoh said to them, why didn't you gather grain? Didn't he announce to you that the years of famine were coming so that it was public? They replied, we gathered much, but it rotted. So Pharaoh replied, if so, if this guy has special powers and his grain doesn't rot, do whatever he tells you. He issued a decree upon the grain and it rotted. What if he issues a decree upon us and we die? Therefore, Pharaoh says, let's all have a bris. Let's all be circumcised. Anyway, that's a very interesting Rashi and uh, happy to happy to have studied it together with you this morning or this afternoon. Okay, now take a look at the next Rashi. Famine spread over the face of the land. What does that mean? Rashi says these are the rich. In other words, even the wealthy were not impervious to the effects of the famine, devastating effects of the famine. Okay, let's stop. Okay, yeah, that's 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 Rashi on, on what we read. That's pretty much it. Now, let's continue. Now we get to the combat. <laughs> it's great. Now the two worlds are going to meet. His family and him, this is where it happens. So until now, we, we, we've cut away from the story of Jacob and his sons, and we've been focusing on the Joseph in Egypt story. But now the two words are going to collide. Two worlds will collide. Genesis chapter 42, verse number one. All right, here we go. Jacob saw that there was grain being sold in Egypt. So Jacob said to his sons, why do you appear satiated? And he said, behold, I've heard that there is grain being sold in Egypt. Go down to Egypt and buy us some food, some from there so that we will live and not die. So basically, he says, there's food in Egypt. He sends his sons, go down and buy some food. But look at this interesting phrase. Why do you appear satiated? Let's see what Rashi says on that, because that is an interesting turn of phrase. Rashi says, look at this. Why do you show yourselves before the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Esau as if you are satiated? In other words, why are you sticking out like a sore thumb as the ones who still have food? Rashi explains, for at that time, they still had grain. The Talmud says they still had food. They had their own food stored up, so they actually did have food. But Jacob didn't want to be the only ones that had their own supply of food because that would arouse the jealousy or the anger, maybe, of their neighbors, the, 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 the descendants of Esau or Ishmael. So he said, therefore, let's also buy food like everybody else so that we don't stick out. Here we go. Simply, it means, why should everyone stare at you and wonder at you that you are not seeking food for yourselves before what you have in your hands is depleted? All right. Basically, make sure you buy food, even though we have now. Soon, our own supply is going to be gone. We don't want others to stare at us, etc. Go ahead and buy food. So he sends his sons down to Egypt. Let me toggle Rashi off and get back down to where we were. Okay. So he tells them, Go down to Egypt and buy, get us some food. All right. This Remember, this is before Instacart and DoorDash. You couldn't just order it up on an app. You had to actually go down to Egypt to get your food. Let's continue. Verse number three. So Joseph's 10 brothers, 10, I'm going to explain in a second. 10 brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. Why 10? There were 12 total. One was in Egypt. His name was Joseph. Jacob did not send... Benjamin, Joseph's younger brother from his mother, Rachel. Jo um, Jacob did not send Benjamin, as the Torah says in verse 4. But Joseph's brother, Benjamin, Jacob did not send with his brothers, because he said to himself, or maybe he said it out loud, lest misfortune befall him. I already lost one son of Rachel. I can't lose the second and final son of Rachel. Remember, he only had... He, from the beginning, he wanted to marry Rachel. 
He ended up marrying Leah and Rachel and had kids from also Bill and Zilpah from the handmaids. He only had two sons from Rachel. One was Joseph, and Joseph was gone for 20 years. The second is Benjamin. Jacob says, I ain't going to send Benjamin. Not going to happen. I can't, I can't afford any other calamity. Let's continue. So there were 10 sons, 10 of the brothers came down to Egypt. So, verse 5, so the sons of Israel came to purchase food among those who came for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Look at this. They came to purchase among those who came. What does that mean, among those who came? They didn't congregate together. They didn't wait in line with all 10 brothers. They actually, there were different lines. Picture, if you will, an amusement park, yeah, or a baseball game, right, where you have turnstiles to get in. You have multiple points of entry so as to alleviate the crush on a single entry point. You had the same dynamic in Egypt. You had multiple entry points. The 10 brothers divided themselves amongst the various entry points so as not to congregate together, so as not to arouse any suspicion as to what's this group of 10 Jewish-looking fellows, right, coming into Egypt for. They divided themselves amongst the different entries. Let's take a look. Now, Joseph, just in case you haven't been following the narrative, the Torah makes sure that we know. Now, Joseph was the ruler over that land, the land of Egypt. And it was he who sold the grain to the entire populace of the land. He was the guy who was making the call on the sales. He was, you know, like, you have to go through all the checkpoints and entrances, but then, like, who's behind it all? Joseph. Or maybe you imagine Joseph kind of like in a, a penthouse view, looking over glass windows, looking over this whole, the whole operation. However you want to imagine it, right? Joseph was overseeing it. And Joseph's brothers came and prostrated themselves to him with their faces to the ground. So when they approach, they meet Mr. Viceroy, Mr. In Charge of the Food. And they come, and as I guess was custom when meeting royalty, they bow down to the ground. Faces to the ground. By the way, Rashi says, and I can toggle it, that he identified the 10 brothers amongst the different lines, and he essentially brought them in as one. Let's take a look at this. Here we go. Take a look. They hid themselves in the crowd so that they would not be recognized because their father had commanded them not to all appear at one entrance, but for each one to enter through his own entrance, so that the evil eye would have no power over them, for they were all handsome and strong, and thus would be envied. Oh, so he didn't want them to congregate together because they're so good looking, and they're so strong. He, well, listen, he's his dad, right? So, of course. So he, he said, don't all congregate together. It's not, it's not a good look. It's not good physically, spiritually, evil eye, kanahara, poo poo poo, whatever. Don't do it. Don't congregate together. Fine. But Joseph, of course, recognized them and at some point brings them in as well. I'm going to toggle Rashi off. It's just easier for me to do it when Rashi is not on. Okay, let's get back to our text. Um, okay, now verse 7. This is beautiful, powerful. And Joseph saw his brothers and he recognized them. But, but... He made himself a stranger to them. In other words, he didn't say, hey, it's me, Joe. Hey, you guys, how's it going? It's been 20 years. No, 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 no. He didn't do that. He made himself a stranger to them. He pretended not to know them. And he spoke to them harshly. So two things, stranger and harshly. By the way, if you're keeping tabs, another act of deception. So many acts of deception throughout Genesis, family, Drama, deception, here is yet another example. For he said to them, uh, sorry, and he said to them, because as if he didn't know, right? Where do you come from? But he didn't just ask them, hey, where, where are you guys coming from? I hope somewhere warm. That's not what he said. He spoke to them harshly. Where do you come from in an accusatory tone? Okay? And what did they say? And they said, we came from the land of Canaan to purchase food. Now the Torah emphasizes Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. So there's a bit of an imbalance in the information in this conversation. He knows exactly who they are. 
and they have no idea who he is. And he is going to take advantage of that, as we'll see, by not revealing his identity, by speaking to them harshly. And that's how this transpires. Oh, one more thing. Yeah, Ray, go ahead. Uh, doesn't he have a dinner for them and sits them chronologically around the table? Yes, yes. That happens a little bit later in the narrative. But yes, oh, okay. they were astonished at that. At that, at how could it? How could the viceroy possibly know that when we're all tall and handsome equally, right? How could he possibly know that? But of course, he knew his siblings. But yeah, the the the, the way this the only way this whole story works is. Obviously, I'm not saying anything that's not obvious, is when you recognize, and, and the, based on the fact, that there's an imbalance in information that's known about this situation, about this scenario. They have no idea who he is. They think he's the viceroy of Egypt, some dude named Safna Paneach, and he knows who they are, and he's Joseph. So he recognized them. They did not recognize him. According to Kabbalah, it means something a little bit different than the obvious. According to this simple meaning, it means he was only 17. He didn't have a beard. He didn't look, you know, like he looked when he was now 30. No, he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. This is seven years later. He, between 17 and 37, he looked different. They, on the other hand, his older brothers, they were all older than him. He, he recognized them. That's the simple meaning. According to Kabbalah, here's what it means. He understood their spiritual level. They didn't get him. From the beginning, they didn't understand him. They thought he was a strange cat. They thought he was, you know, different and strange and whatever. They didn't recognize him, but he recognized them. They couldn't fathom how you could have a nice Jewish boy in Egypt as the viceroy and still be a tzaddik. Couldn't imagine what you could be vice president of the superpower of the world and still be a, a devout Jew, et cetera? The answer is yes, whatever, whatever that meant for him then. But the answer is yes, they couldn't imagine such a thing. So that's at another level. They could never imagine that the viceroy of Egypt would be their Jewish brother. It wouldn't even be possible, right? OK, so next verse, and this is also powerful. Every verse, it seems, contains like wallops of information. Joseph, remember the dreams. Do you remember the dreams about the bundles of sheaves in the field bowing down to his bundle? About the stars and the sun and moon stars in heaven bowing down to his star? Yeah, you guessed it. He remembered that too. 20. He... Hold on. From 17 to 30 is 13 years plus seven. Right. So 20 years. Oh, but we don't know how old, he, how old he was when he had the dreams. Okay, at least 20 years prior, he had these dreams of them bowing down to him. And guess what just happened? A few verses prior, right? They prostrated themselves to him with their faces to the ground. They did bow down to him. Joseph remembers the dreams. It just happened. And he said to them, trying to, to orchestrate trying to orchestrate some sort of, and we'll talk about why he did this. But again, in the, in the, um, the harsh vein, he said to them harshly, accusatorily, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. By the way, remembering the dreams also makes him accuse them of being spies. Think about it. In the dream, all 11 brothers and his father are bowing down to him. Do you remember that? 11 bundles in the field, right? 11 stars in the heaven plus the sun and the moon were bowing down to him. What just happened in actuality? How many brothers bowed down to him? 10, not 11. We're one bundle and one star off. Ay, the math is not working. Joseph remembered the dreams. Not only did they just bow down to him, but it's a little bit off. They only bow down to him because he was the viceroy and because they recognized him as the viceroy, not as Joseph. It was Joseph, they would be embarrassed and maybe hug, but they wouldn't bow down. They're only bowing down because they don't know who he is. Are you with me on this? Again, his honor is also the product of deception. Again, his honor 
from them, the fact that they're honoring him in such a way of bowing down to the ground is only because of the fact that they don't know who he really is. They think he's just the viceroy, some other guy. If he's family, whatever, right? Okay, right. everyone's a big shot until they come home. When they come home, it's like, ah, oh, Yankel's here. All right, good, do the dishes, right? That's how it works in life, right? So, but if you're the viceroy and we don't know you, then we're gonna bow down to you. But only 10 out of, out of 11 brothers and no father. So what? So so he therefore needed to hide his identity, to to maintain the ruse of viceroy. He also needed to orchestrate his brother, the eleventh star, to come down. So here's his plan. All right. So stay with me. Again, does, does what I just said make sense? In other words, he remember the dreams. The dreams had almost been fulfilled, but not exactly. Therefore, he had to concoct a story to get Benjamin down to Egypt. So he says, you are spies, and you have come to see the nakedness of the land. As the commentators explain, nakedness means the weak parts of the land. You, you're coming, you're spies, and you're looking for the weak points of Egypt to attack. Verse 10, and they said to him, no, my master, your servants have come to buy food. That's it. <laughs> We don't mean any harm. We're just we're just hungry. We are all the sons of one man. We are honest. Your servants were never spies, right? We're not spies. But he said to them, "No." Remember the harshly thing. But you have come to see the nakedness of the land. He doubles down, and they said, "Look, we are your servants." Oh, sorry. We, your servants, are twelve brothers. They said, "We're going to give you all the information." We're not going to hold back. We actually are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. We do not represent a nation. We're not spying for Russia. This is not that. This is we're just a family of 12 brothers and have a father living in a different country in Canaan. And behold, right, so why only 10 brothers? The youngest is with our father today, and one is gone. Well, you know who that is. That's the viceroy. All right, they didn't know that, but that's the viceroy. That's Joseph, who they're talking to. How, I, how ironic. And Joseph said to them, exactly, for the third time he accuses them. This is exactly just what I have spoken to you, saying you are spies. Now, the, this story that you just told me, exactly, that's my point. You're spies. How, how, where do you, how, what does that mean? What's the logic? Let's toggle Rashi. Okay, let's see what Rashi says. All right, stay with me in the narrative. Um, here we go. The thing that I have spoken, namely that you were spies, is true and correct. This is a simple interpretation. You notice what he's saying here? He's tripling down. He says, I hear you, 12 sons, one is gone, one is with dad, we're just from one family, no big deal, I'm calling you out, I don't believe your story, you're spies. That's a simple explanation. However, listen to this one. The Midrashic interpretation is like this. Joseph said to them, there's part of the narrative that's cut out. Joseph said to them, and if you find this last brother that's missing, Joseph, and they, his owners, demand a large ransom from you, will you ransom him? Yes, they replied. He said to them, and if they say that they will not return him for any money, what will you do? They said, for this we have come to kill or to be killed. He said to them, exactly, this is exactly what I said to you. You've come to slay the people of the city. I divine with my cup, my sorcerer's cup, that two of you destroyed the large city of Shechem. Booyah. Look at that. He pulls off a little family history that no one knew. That no one knew. He said, you guys are violent. He basically led them into admitting that they would resort to acts of violence. He said, if you find this missing brother, yeah, what would you do? Ransom him. You pay, pay the ransom. And if they're not accepting a ransom, we'll kill the captors. Ah, violence. You guys are violent boys. Ah, you're not just handsome and strong. You're also violent. Okay, I know who we're dealing with here. By the way, I happen to also know through sorcery and or family history, but through sorcery that y'all, the two of you, two out of your 10 destroyed an entire city of Shem. Remember when Dina was abducted. 
So he says to them, you guys are violent. You guys are here for, for trouble. You're here to cause problems. You're spies. And don't tell me otherwise. And that's it. All right. Now, let me toggle this Rashi off. Let's get back. The narrative is simmering. I don't want the boil to stop. Let's, let's keep on going. Here we go. Um, with this, verse 15, you shall be tested. He says, I believe you're spies. I believe that you're coming to destroy us. I believe that you're violent, etc. But this is your test. By Pharaoh's life, I love how he swears on Pharaoh's life. That's easy, right? By Pharaoh's life, you shall not leave this place until your youngest brother comes here. I mean, you can see the plot, right? Youngest brother, brother number 11, the dreams. He's got to get all 11 to bow down to him without knowing who he is. Because once they know who he is, they're not going to bow down to, you know, brother Joe. So he, he's got to make this happen. He says, I'm not, I don't believe you. You're not leaving until you bring, until you bring um, Benjamin. Send one of you, he says, and fetch, sorry, send one of you and let him fetch your brother. So nine of you stay in Egypt. One of you go back home, get your brother, and you will be imprisoned in the meantime, so that your words will be tested whether truth is with you. And if not, as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. Do you actually have an 11th brother? Is what you said true that that your youngest brother is with dad? Is that even true? Is it fake news? All right. I'm going to hold you guys captive until that until you bring him and you can send one to get him. And he put them in prison for three days. Now they're, you can imagine what's going on inside of them. They're all, you know, they just came down to buy food. <laughs> Talk about uh, purchase gone wrong. Verse 18. I mean, that's an awkward supermarket visit. On the third day of the incarceration, all 10 are incarcerated. Joseph said to them, do this and live. I, oh, sorry, there should be punctuation here. Do this and live. In other words, if you do this, it'll be good for you. I fear God. Anyway, that's, that's, how, that's how this reading ends. It ends kind of like literally a cliffhanger. He says, after three days, brings them out of prison, stands them in front of him and says, okay, Here's what we're going to do. What, what are we going to do? All right, stay tuned tomorrow. All right, that, that's it for today. Yes, literally cliffhanger, literally cliffhanger. So we're right in the middle of the story. Brothers have come to Joseph. Joseph recognizes them. They don't recognize him. Again, spiritually, what it means is they couldn't fathom that somebody could be so worldly and yet so spiritual at the same time. They couldn't fathom that that could be their brother. And, uh, and he needs to fulfill the, uh, the prophecy of the 11 brothers bowing down to him. They can't know who he is. They need all 11 brothers there. And so he's telling them to bring Benjamin and holding the rest until, until they do so. All right, that's it for today. I don't really have anything like too, I mean, other than what I shared before, I don't have anything like super mystical or whatever on it, but I think the story is intriguing on its own. Any other comments? Questions, ideas. Hey, Mark. A right, quick question. Yes. Why does my translation say, uh, so your words will be verified and you will not die as opposed to you will live? Ah, all right. So hold on. Hold on. You ask a good question. Let's toggle Rashi. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to toggle Rashi on the very last, the very last verse. The Chayu usually means and you will live, but let's see how Rashi imagines it in his commentary. All right, all the way down to the bottom. No. Nope. It's not, there's no Rashi on this. No. Listen, Vichyu is related to Chai, life. But you're saying the translation is if you don't do this, you will die? It's like the opposite? The negative? No, uh, and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you will not die. Yeah. What's the, what's the translation of the Chumash? It's you live or die. Or is that die. verse 16 or verse 18? Which verse is that? That's 20. No, I'm, I'm sorry, We're 19. Not, oh, well, that makes sense. We're not up to verse 20. 20. 20 Aha. Yeah. Mystery solved. We're not up to verse 20. We're only through verse 18. Oh, okay. That clarified. In that case, 
I'm going with your translation. <laughs> oh. I don't think there's even going to be a, um, a dispute between the translations. Okay. So, yeah. As we'll see, Joseph modifies his, his arrangement. And he says, you know what? Uh, I'll let all of you go, but I'm holding one. Instead of holding all of you and sending one, I'll hold just one and send the rest okay. to bring down. Back. But we'll see that in the next reading. Well, that's the next. That's, that's Okay, I see. Yeah, I see. That's it. So what's the moral of the story? Don't mess with Joseph. But also we see here sometimes the power of deception. How in order to get the blessings, Jacob had to hide. In order to... Um, get his brother's approval. Joseph had a high. I mean, this is the first time his brothers honored and respected him. They called him master. They bowed down to him. I mean, on a very human level, Joseph probably enjoyed it, right? He, he was hated by his brothers, and now they respect him. They only respect him because they don't know who he is. But what kind of respect is that if, you're only, if, you, only, if you can only be respected without being known for your true identity? You know what I mean? It's like a double-edged sword. Like, on the one hand, it's great, but on the other hand, you have to wear a costume in order to get respected. It's no, that's no fun either. So complicated dynamics. That's my point. Complicated dynamics. All stuff to think about as we navigate our own lives and relationships. All right. By the okay. way, this is not even Rabbi Ari. No, I'm kidding. It's just me. Um, all right. That would be cool if it was really something. Whatever. I'm just saying. If I could pull, could have pulled that off, that would be epic. All right. That's it for today. We'll see you tomorrow. Same bad time, same bad channel. There's no JLI tomorrow, which means Thursday DPP is on. It's been, it's been six weeks, but we're back on. All right. All right. I got one more thing. I do have one more thing, just real quickly. Uh, he's swearing by, by the Jewish God. He says, I fear God. He says, Holokim, I need your array. So did this? Yes. Yeah. By the life of Pharaoh, he says, by the life of Pharaoh. So he throws yeah. Pharaoh onto the bus in case, in case anything yeah. happens with the oath, like let Pharaoh take the heat, whatever. Um, but he does say, I fear God. He does mention Elohim, which should have been some sort of clue to them. Because, you know, again, I mentioned that Pharaoh doesn't usually start like waxing poetic about God, nor would uh, the viceroy, you would think. But again, they had, they, look, I, I can't even tell you how not on their radar it was that this guy would be their brother. It's not even, I, I, it's, not, it's not even, like, I don't even know how to, there are no words that I could say to describe the gap between the possibility of this guy being Joseph in their minds. It's, it's not even, it's not a possibility. Joseph was like, you will be a slave somewhere in a dungeon. The Viceroy of Egypt? Not possible. But, by the way, this whole narrative also reminds us sometimes in life, there are fierce challenges that we're very, you know, scared about. But really, as explained in Kabbalah, the challenge is really there to help us. It's there to, to bring us to a higher level. Like the Yetzirah, animal soul, evil inclination, animal soul, Evil in the world in general, the choice to do evil, it's all there to help us rise higher spiritually. In other words, that foe who's antagonizing you, the viceroy who's giving you a hard time, you know, running you around in circles, it just might be your brother. And you, you need to accomplish something there, but it's really your ally and not your adversary. Hope that makes sense. It's a theme that I'll come back to as we go through the story. Um, but remember, they thought this guy was their worst nightmare. Meanwhile, I mean, and he, it did do a good job selling that, but really he was family. All right. See you all. Hope your family is nice and not doing that to you. Um, may we all have uh, lots of blessings and healthy relationships and a wonderfully warm Wednesday. Don't forget tonight, menorah lighting North Highland Park at the corner of North Highland and St. Charles, or as we call it in the hood, Simcha Charles. And um, <laughs> so that is tonight at 5.30 p.m. Don't forget to be there if you can. Well, it, the park has plenty of room so we can each have our own space. And I'm going to have a yardstick with me attached to another yardstick. If everybody gets too close, it's going to get poked. That's it. I'm kidding about the poking. But anyway, there should be plenty of space. Comfortable. We'll have donuts. 
and it's gonna be a party. All right, see you all soon. Happy Hanukkah, happy day six. Okay. Take care. Hi, Ray. Bye, Mark. Bye, Joy.